You okay, guys? Oh, this, I have a lot of room, huh? <laughs> it's good like that, it's good, it's good. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> Come and start. Muy bien. <laughs> Your brother also there, huh? Hola. <laughs> it looks same, I know. <laughs> okay, business as usual. Mm -hmm. So, how's everything? <laughs> She's like daughter or something? <laughs> no room? <laughs> Yeah, the guys have a lot of room, huh? Mm -hmm. I know why they don't want to meditate, so they can have a lot of room. Yeah, they don't want to get initiation a lot, so they can have a lot of room. These two rooms, oh, where are other people? Downstairs? Downstairs in the room. Huh? In the big room, right? In the other room as well. Okay, I want to know how we arrange it. Uh, we have two rooms over there. Uh, when I'm here, uh, they at least they can sit in there. Yeah, but don't use the bathroom uh, for your sake, huh? <laughs> I don't think you like to hear the outer sound, no? <laughs> Boom. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, maybe later. They already sit in their room. Do they have TV? Yes. yes. They all have TV? Yes. Every room. Wonderful. Then just leave it as is. They can hear me already, and they're very happy already. So we save the actuality tomorrow. <laughs> uh, because right now, if they come up, it will be too noisy, no? If, But there's no TV in there. That's the thing. You put two TV in this room, OK? So whenever I'm up here, uh, we can have more room. That's what, no? Huh? Any question, guys? Huh? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I, I wanted to come earlier, but it wasn't very uh, favorable. <laughs> so I wait a little bit, huh? Eh? Yeah. You want to hear some jokes or some story? <laughs> jokes or story? Joke? Story? <laughs> How many story? How many want to hear story? Okay. How many want to hear jokes? <laughs> <laughs> and the others uh, don't have any, <laughs> don't know what to do, right? Anything. Anything. Mm. Check it out. Oh, we are in a retreat, so maybe we should read a story, huh? Uh, no question? Before I start, any question? Question? No? Yeah? No. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> no question? Good question. <laughs> All right. Now, this is a story in the Buddha's uh, scripture. Eh? It said, the wealthy prince. Uh, there's a comment before we started. It says, the life of a householder is beset with concerns that are in conflict with spiritual pursuits. If my English is a little bit wrong, please correct me quick, okay? Yeah. So we can, you know, like, <laughs> make it perfect. Master is always perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot speak wrong word, you know. <laughs> Even if she's not English, she's supposed to speak Oxford, you know. <laughs> yeah. Those searching for the truth gladly spurn such a life. Well, you know very well. That's a Buddha's type. Hmm? And whoever make this comment must be one of the monk, yeah? Because he enjoy the wandering mendicant life. So he advised us, anyone in the household to please, not please, but he introduced such a beautiful life to them, yeah? But you know what? <laughs> in India it's different, okay? All you do is just go find a teacher, a monk teacher, okay? Let him shave your head or you shave it yourself and uh, put on a, a saffron, a rope, 
That's all you do. And then you walk anywhere you want. And you're on your own. Yeah? Okay. It means anybody who really wants to know the truth, yeah, would have liked to have a renunciating life. Yeah? Renunciation life. That's what I thought. Ha. Huh. And then I look everywhere. My God. If everybody just stand together in one monastery every day, eat and <laughs> listen to story. Yeah, then then how are we going to save the world? Huh? Okay. The Kwan Yin Bodhisattva might have 10,000 arms, 10,000 uh, eyes, but I don't. <laughs> you see any 10,000 arms anywhere? <laughs> 10 finger maybe. Okay, so you are my 10,000 arms and 10,000 eyes. You are my workforce. Yeah, you are the salvation of the world. And for that, I want to thank you here, okay? Once and for all. Uh, you see, even if... And also we need to have SMTV, you know? And for that, everybody have to learn this, learn that. Has so much work to do. Even just here, a small retreat, we have a lot of work to do. And we need a couple of, uh, you know, lousy idiots here. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. You're very smart. Yeah, just joking. Okay, joking, joking. Don't get sensitive. Uh, it's like uh, love talk, you know. <laughs> You're lousy. <laughs> You idiot! <laughs> I love you, idiot! <laughs> like that. Yeah? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah? Sometimes people love each other, they call each other a noodle. Yeah. Or Chinese baozi. Yeah. <laughs> I call a couple of them a like food, you know, like baozi. And min bao, mean bread. And baozi mean Chinese dumpling, you know, steamed dumpling because they love these things, so I just call them like that, so to satisfy them, so they don't have to come back <laughs> next life, just to eat. Bao zi and mian bao, huh? Sometimes I call somebody noodle, you know? <laughs> wood stick. <laughs> the guy walk like a wood stick, you know? He don't move. Just maybe the head a little bit, you know? Walk <laughs> I go like wood stick, <laughs> huh? <laughs> You don't know some of the SMTV correspondents or so-called hosts, you know, they also like that, you know? And if they put their hand here, they don't know what to do. <laughs> so I always have to tell them, cut it, uh, up, up to here only. <laughs> if they don't know what to do with their hand, cut their hand off. <laughs> I don't mean that, you know, cut the part that their hands are, or put something there accordingly, huh? Mm. No, why do we go so far like that? Okay. Okay, all right. This is a comment for the story to come. Hmm? The story of a wealthy prince. Now, uh, by the way, you say it's dry and uh, hot. Do you want the heater off? Turn the heater off, please. Off, off already? Man, we so economize when you're here. <laughs> We are a green, green group. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, you know what? <laughs> All we need is just a spray of water on top, like those when they have a uh, fire. <laughs> when the fire alarm go, the water run all over, then you don't feel dry anymore. Okay, something missing, huh? It's a spray, okay? <laughs> it's very easy. You don't need to make a very sophisticated. Just get a water garden hose, <laughs> garden hose, you know, and open it, <laughs> and, and just let it on the floor. Then it will just run all over the place. <laughs> the garden hose, yeah. When you let it without controlling and open it, it will run all over, <laughs> and everybody <laughs> will get a share of it. Nah? We are very innovative, you know. <laughs> I can invent anything. <laughs> yeah, in my little house. Uh, we don't have a faucet, you know, so I just, um, I did it myself, I didn't want trouble. With it. I connect the pipe with uh, with one of the running water from the main house, and then there's those those holes with the control, you know? Yeah, and when you want water, you press it, and the water comes out. 
it's the same, no? And not as beautiful and convenient like the, uh, how you say? Tap. Yeah. But it has water. Yeah. But in the beginning, oh, it stink. Because of the plastic, you know? New one. Oh, it smell terrible. But later on, it's okay. After we walk to the garden for a while, it's become better. Thank you so much. Maybe I need a straw. Do we have a straw? <laughs> he, he doesn't understand much English. You know. he, he thought I'm speaking to you. Yeah. I like that kind of people. I don't like talkative people too much. It's make trouble for me. Because most of the time they talk around, around, around until they come to the point. And meanwhile, I sleep in between, you know. Have you come to the point yet? <laughs> Not yet? Okay, continue. <laughs> uh, continue. Are you done? Okay, tell me now what? <laughs> Telling you, uh, disciples are very cute people, very cute. So, you see, it's nice also to be a, a renunciate, eh? just like some of the residents. But I don't think they're much different anymore because they also work very hard, you know, harder than you even. <laughs> I don't let them be just a la lazy monk, huh? <laughs> okay, so they're also happy to do it. And you outside, you're also happy to lead your life and you do your stuff, ne? Eh? A little money just to keep you alive, and the rest you try to do SMTV, okay? I mean, not just SMTV, I mean the uh, flyers, yeah? About vegetarianism and the NASA ad, yeah? We need that. Understand me? We need to. Anywhere you go, you just take a stack of flyers with you in the supermarket. Anywhere you smile at you, you say, hey, good news for you. <laughs> and you put in the, those. You know, um, huh? Car wiper. Car wiper in the front, eh? in the front of the car. There's a wiper, no? Okay. You just put there. It's legal, no? Not it's not legal. Huh? Not everywhere. It's not everywhere. So what do they do? They jail you for telling them that uh, <laughs> the world is <laughs> going to to die. It's okay, jail me. You have only four years anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, at least you know it's not a life sentence. Yeah, yeah, we're not afraid anymore. We just do it. Oh, a good heart, you know, good heart. Not like advertising or selling or anything. Just to inform people. Yeah, so that they know what to do, if they want to do. If they don't, okay, it's not our problem. Huh? But I don't think they will jail you when they see the, you know, immediately, you know, like that and. They, they would know this is some important things, yeah? I don't think they would jail you. If they do, you know it's not life sentence anyway, right? <laughs> because actually it takes some time, uh, several years, to, to settle the case. <laughs> you know, meanwhile, you continue to put it everywhere. I, you, they can't just jail you immediately, you know? I need to go to get to the lawyer, the court, the police, and whatever, yeah? And meanwhile, <laughs> well, continue your job. Huh? And if they leave, past four or five years, they will thank you, yeah? If we die, good luck to you. <laughs> you don't need to go to jail. By the time, you know, the process, right? The process of, uh, how you say, court case, just several years, four years, who knows? And maybe they think, oh, it's just a small case, just <laughs> let her be free. <laughs> oh, you can bail yourself one dollar or <laughs> something. Uh, don't worry, we're not fear anymore, yeah? We're working for the world, not for us, so we don't care, huh? Capish me? <laughs> and during the red light, yeah? You open your window, hand it out to them. <laughs> no? You do that? No? There's so many ways to do it. Oh, put it in mailbox, yeah, of course. No? Anywhere you can. Don't repeat it, though. Everywhere you already went, you note it down so other people don't go. You see? And you don't go back. Understand that? Yeah.
because maybe the first time they didn't see you or they didn't want to jail you, but the second time, who knows? <laughs> okay. Now, that's the reason you cannot all be monk, huh? Anyway, in a Buddha time, not everybody is monk anyway. You know that, right? Hmm? Because the thing is, people have to make offering to the Buddha, no? And somebody has to earn money, no? Yeah, in the Buddha's time, the monks go out uh, for arms, yeah? For food. Yeah, and whatever they get, they share it and eat together, just one time a day. Because um, that's what they think they should eat, you know? If they're not doing anything, not laboring, then uh, eat only once a day. I mean, uh, they mean it just eat like a ma minimum, enough to sustain the body, but not to eat to become fat and all that. But I don't know, I saw all the painting of the Buddhas and his monk, they are very choppy, no? <laughs> not fat, but... Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm. Yeah, and in China, all the monks are very, you know, well kept. <laughs> because they believe that uh, if your face is round or your body is, you know, choppy like you, <laughs> then you have a lot of merit. Understand me? I mean, you are a meritorious person. Uh, monks and lay alike. If you're fat, not too fat, but round, you know, choppy, yeah, and mm, something like that, <laughs> then you're okay, yeah. I don't know if India have the same situation or tradition, but China is like that. I don't know if... Uh, but in India it's different, you know? If you become a monk, it's easier. The Buddha doesn't have to take care of you at all. All you do is... Either stay around with the Buddha if you have a room. Oh, normally they don't have any house, except sometimes a disciple built it for them. Yeah. Then so they stay with the Buddha, the Buddha don't have to take care of nothing. Yeah. They go out and beg for food. Yeah? And then come home and share it together. Anyway, you know, suppose we go and beg for food in Austria, hey? <laughs> the police will come and beg you to go to... <laughs> to his station to explain why your hair is short and you, why your hair is short and your robe is long. <laughs> and why you wear pink color like uh, maybe gay people. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Uh, joking. Nowadays, people know already what a monk is like, right? They're like Hare Krishna people. They go out and... But they don't beg for food, though, huh? No, okay. Oh, sour man. Oh, I don't think he likes me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just called him before. <laughs> I'm sorry. Forgive me, huh? They say forgiveness is, uh, you know, is very good for you. <laughs> I just saw it, yeah. You know, yeah, sometimes it's your karma, eh? Yeah? Or sometimes our incompatibility, yeah? Sometimes you talk too much. Sometimes I'm stressed out already and you blah, blah, blah about nonsense, yeah? So I have to cut it, yeah? I'm finished. So I can do all the job. If sit there, listen to you like a gossip column, then, uh, you know, I don't have time for anything else. I have to meditate also, and eh? the more the better, to digest the karma. I have to do many physical works. I have to take care of SMTV between the dogs, water, and the birds, the nuts, <laughs> yeah? I take care of my family also, huh? Okay, all right. So if you blah, blah, you know, about nonsense, there's no, no need, huh? Understand? So sometimes I'm okay because I'm polite, yeah, 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 yeah. And sometimes I lost it, <laughs> just like you. I lost it many times. Because I just blah, blah, no end, about nothing. At the end, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> if I know what they're talking about, maybe okay, but truly nonsense. Nothing makes sense, you know? If I ask for a straw, they will talk about, uh, you know, the tree outside, you know, how old is the tree, and who planted it, and 
last time the typhoon came, it almost died, and then somebody put it back up, and then now it's okay. <laughs> you know, it has nothing to do with the straw that I wanted. Do you capish? Yeah? Mm. In that case, I lost it, especially when I lose my voice already. Huh? I have to talk nonsense. Okay, now, let's go back to the story. Well, that was a story by itself, huh? <laughs> Always, huh? You want some water first? Water? Yes or no? no. You sure? Yeah. If somebody need water, uh, please uh, go out, get some, and come back, okay? Or just stay over there. Hmm. Okay, now this is the story of the wealthy prince. Once the Bodhisattva was born into a family of great wealth, renowned for his virtue and good conduct even, not just great wealth, but virtues and good conduct. They are highly esteemed by the people, the family, huh? okay. like a refreshing well to those who led good lives. This family share their store of treasures and grain with the shram, shramanas and brahmans. These are different class of people. And open their home to friends and kin. You know what brahman like, right? Brahmans. You know, in the old time, if you are initiated, then you're called brahmans. Yeah? And that's how it become different caste up to now. Yeah? The Brahman is the one who are close to Brahma. You see? Close to the god of the three worlds. Yeah. At that time, that's all you get. Huh? <laughs> Maybe that's all you need. You don't need to go to the fifth level. But nowadays, some uh, silly master give them a fifth level and they're complaining still. What? <laughs> Only fifth level? <laughs> And then you go to the tent, <laughs> and you left us behind. <laughs> Fifth level? No. I mean no like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like or not like, me stay there. <laughs> That's all me entitled to. <laughs> okay? If me lucky, <laughs> a silly master come down sometime and visit me, okay? If me not lucky, <laughs> me not good, then uh, uh, that's it, huh? Okay. You see, the shramana is probably the one convenient method, yeah? Okay. In the old time, initiated and convenient method probably come to that house often, maybe because he's a contact person, yeah? And he's uh, wealthy, huh? So he can uh, afford to help people, yeah? So it sounds like a good contact person, eh? Or maybe even a master, who knows? Eh? Otherwise, how would the Brahmins and the Shamanas uh, flock into this house often? And they share the wealth, you know, sounds like in, the, in some of my places before. You see? Like a refreshing well to those who led good lives. Yeah? This family share their store of treasures share with those who led good lives. You see that? Yeah? So, the one who led good lives are the one who came to his house, yeah? Maybe for initiation. Mm, yeah, maybe just to wait for initiation or to listen to these courses on spiritual subject. Yeah? That's why. Because uh, people who are not uh, interested in spiritual subject, they won't go there. Yeah? Even if they go there once, they don't come back again. Huh? So that's what. The poor and the needy also were sustained by their gifts. Wow, good, huh? Wow, artisans, artisans, right? Huh? Yeah? Uh, received their patronage and protection. Even the king was pleased to secure their favor and hospitality. Ah! So it must be a master then, uh, of some kind, huh? Okay. It could be that this master only know the way to Brahman, yeah? It could be that he want to 
teach people only that much because he think there's no use teaching them any further and well, they won't go there. <laughs> they won't be able to go to the fifth level. And it also could be that at that time, all people know was Brahman. You see, they have only three treasure. There's this uh, something from the astral level, yeah? The god of the astral level. Hmm? And then Vishnu and Brahma. <laughs> Vishnu, at that time, is the god of second level. And Brahma, the god, oh, it's just the name of the region, yeah, the name of the title. It's not his name. Yeah, but then they call him also like that after a while. So they just say Vishnu Brahma. Mm -hmm. I guess it's already uh, very familiar, you know, uh, Vishnu Brahma. So he used that, yeah, to sell. <laughs> to sell his spiritual uh, good, yeah? Otherwise, what for t the other name a secret anyway, yeah? The other name already is a secret, so that he probably tell his disciple only, yeah? Okay. No, mean the close disciple, all right. So it's like that. That's why we hear only Brahma, okay? Yeah. Brahman is a higher caste highest caste in India. That was in those days when the Master can initiate you into the Brahma kingdom, yeah? And you are high than the rest, higher than the rest. Then you can call yourself Brahma, yeah? But now, uh, nowadays, if you don't have a Master and you're not gone up to the third level, then it's no use to have a caste like Brahma. Yeah, understand? But they still have this kind of caste system in India. When I was there, you know, it's still, it's still functioning, the caste system. If you touch a so-called Brahma caste, and they will, they will scold you. They will run away from you, yeah. They don't want anyone who is not Brahma caste to touch them, because they believe if any lower class, uh, Brahma is the highest, yeah? Any lower class touch them, they will lose their caste. I, I don't know how it happened, <laughs> but that's what they believe. Maybe after initiation, you know, we don't really feel like physical contact too much like before, no? Yeah, is, is it true that you could share some karma with the people when they are lower level than you are? And that is for sure. Yeah, but we willingly to give eh? what we can, if we can. Mm, and uh, sometimes we go home, get sick or something, but that's okay too. So even if the king was pleased to secure their favor and hospitality, that means this wealthy family or person is a saint, yeah, a master of some kind. Otherwise, what for the king go there? The king doesn't need any financial support from them. Yeah? Right? No, huh? Do you think the king needs to go there and <laughs> ask for some money? No. Okay. It's all right. So, as the Bodhisattva grew older, his scholarly interests led him to study all branches of the usual worldly sciences as well as the more esoteric arts. His scholastic accomplishments, his physical beauty, and the worldly knowledge he display without infringing on the precepts of the Dharma. This Bodhisattva learns a lot of things and use that to help people, yeah? But he doesn't use it in a way as to in bring, yeah, uh, the precepts of the Dharma. You know what precept, right? Like five precepts. Like he learned whatever the art that doesn't require killing, yeah, and stealing or lying or anything like that. You see what I mean? Yeah. Or maybe he learned something and then he kind of uh, modified it to suit the uh, spiritual person.
All right. Wow, he learns a lot of stuff. Because he still keep the precepts of the Dharma, you know, of the teaching, you know, five precepts, yeah, like the moral precept, like no harming sentient beings, no stealing, yeah? no sexual misconduct, no, what else? Lying. Huh? Lying. No lying, and hey, what else? Huh? No alcohol and drug. Is that belong to there? Yeah. Intoxicants, yeah? Anything that intoxicated you and make you lose your brain, your mind, and I mean like um, damage your nerves and make you lose yourself, make you addictive, addicted, then it's no good, okay? No. Because he always keep the precepts, even though he had learned so many things in the world, people loved him so much. He won all the hearts that know him. Yeah. Everybody think of him as their kinsman. Yeah, dear to everyone. For not family ties alone, but the virtues or vices which bring esteem and scorn, or scorn, are what make others friends or strangers. Yeah, that's what they think. Yeah, it means it's not because you are a member that you are a kinsman. Yeah? If you are virtuous and morally high, then everybody will feel close to you and they become your family. Isn't that not so with us? Yeah? We like that here, huh? Okay. Now, it came about, is that not true? Huh? That we come here together and feel like family, huh? And trusting each other and feel comfortable with each other, huh? even though we've never seen each other before. Some we've seen before here, some not, and it's always a pleasure to see each other even stranger, or first-time friends, or many-time friends. Still feel comfy with each other, huh? Okay, that's what it is. Same with this Bodhisattva here. Now it came about that the great being began to think only the path of renunciation. Ah, now he want to become a renunciate. He think about that. Experience of the householder's life with his painful struggle for gain, has shown him how inconsistent such a life was with spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. He has so much wealth, yeah, he had so much money, and he had all the uh, respect and admiration from everybody, even the king of the country. And still, he thinks, that to be a monk is better. Yeah. You see, this is the the thing with uh, Dr. Donovchek, huh? He also did not want to be a president anymore. After he got some enlightenment, he knows he's all transient, so he doesn't want to be a president anymore. If he run, he would win again, because he win five, six times already in a row. Nobody is weightier than he was, yeah? Anyway, he said he doesn't want to be attached to position and fame. He thinks he could do better if he's free from political obligation. On the other hand, he understood well that the happiness to be found in the growths of the ascetics. So he compared the two lives, yeah? He know that uh, the household life is not as good, yeah? But if he become a monk and he just stay anywhere, in the grove somewhere, yeah, like a forest or um, maybe a cave, then he would feel better. That's what he thinks, yeah. So gradually his mind grew detached 
from the pleasures of his home. Wow. Upon the death of his father and mother, and while he was still in mourning, he left his splendid home and estate, bestowing all he owned on friends and kin, on the poor and on shra shramanas and brahmans. He left the city. He traveled through village and town, through kingdoms and capitals of kingdoms, until finally he settled in a wooded plateau near a small town. There he soon gained renown for his tranquility, the quality of his contemplation, and his superior conduct. Here come. <laughs> You're famous again. It's the same. But maybe now that he's a monk, he doesn't have to worry anymore, okay? He doesn't have to buy a hotel and <laughs> take care of other paperwork, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nowadays, you need dinero, eh? <laughs> okay. It's quicker, yeah? It's quicker. Otherwise, even if I run around from one town to the next, yeah, I can run around all my life. Just talk one day today, and they go home, they forgot. Understand me? But television they watch again and again, and it probably imprints in their mind to be, uh, you know, a spiritual practitioner. You know, maybe slowly, maybe quickly, but that's what it is. Uh, I told you something that I cannot prove, but I tell you nevertheless. You know, just one poem that I wrote, you know, the uh, poem of the piglet. 130,000 people turn into vegetarian. For good, huh? And then we continue with that, huh? Okay? Uh, I cannot read it. I cannot. Uh, because every time I read that, I cry again. That's why I cannot uh, recite it. <laughs> By the way, you guys watch television? Yeah. It's MTV? Yeah, yeah every day? Yeah. You must, okay? You must. Maybe we should uh, put it in the, uh, uh, I say, the five precepts, become six precepts. <laughs> <laughs> the six, thou shalt watch the Supreme Master television every day. Okay, you must, you should, so that you'll be in touch. You know, you'll be one with the whole group, understand, and with me, because I'm working for it as well, you know, and behind the scenes. Huh? Okay. So when you're watching it, you're with me, yeah? even if I'm not there, you see? And you were together with all the viewers, you see? And it's a big pack. And we can transfer our thought, you see? Our moral, our virtue to them, without seeing them even, yeah? If we want with them, we share, see what I mean? And that's how we save the world. I mean, a little bit at a time, eh? Okay. His clear demeanor, a result of years of meditation practice, was natural and sincere. His language, though demonstrating his wisdom, was full of modesty, a delight to both mind and ear. Uninterested in any gain, he discoursed in a learned yet very gentle manner with his audience, skillfully tracing the boundary between what was to be accepted and what was to be rejected according to the teaching. In short, his behavior exemplify what is expected from a virtuous and homeless ascetic. And when people became aware that he had renounced high rank, they honored him even more. Indeed, virtues invariably seem more appealing when found in persons of high birth. 
just as moonbeams grow lovelier when shining on a beautiful object. So, are you on high birth, any of you? Raise hand? No. Yeah, why is that? Is that discrimination or what? Why people respect a person more? The same virtues, but they respect a person more if he came from a high birth, I mean, you know, wealthy or in a high position family. Why is that? Tell me. Anybody knows? Yeah, tell me. Because he had to sacrifice mm. uh, everything he had. Yes. But other people, wealth is a temptation. Yeah. And then they forget the spiritual. Oh. And that person did okay. the other way around. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. <laughs> So he was a prince, anyway, huh? A prince of some kind, yeah? Okay. Maybe he's not a prince from the king, but, you know, prince from royalty lineage, yeah? There are many kinds of prince, you know, right? Okay. Your royal highness prince, or just your royal prince, or your highness prince, or your prince. <laughs> That's right. If a person for sick, his wealth, his position, his comfortable life, to seek a renunciated life. And of course, like he lost more, yeah? He has more to lose. So people would think that this kind of person is more sincere, more true. Maybe it's not like that, you know? A person who has nothing or who has less, maybe also very sincere and true to himself, yeah? When people want to seek the truth, doesn't matter from which corner of life, it's still the same, yes? But because uh, in the physical life, people tend to value wealth and position anyway, yeah? And if you can forsake it, then people think, wow, he's really something, he's strong. His search for spiritual life is truly laudable, yeah. Sincerely, yeah. Anyway, okay. Just, but it doesn't mean that only when you have a lot of money and high position and you renounce it, then you become a highly spiritual person. It's not always like that. Remember Kabir? Yeah? He's just a shoes, shoes uh, repairer, right? Shoes repairer and maker. And many, many others, yeah? I just remember Kabir, but I don't remember. There was a guy, uh, I don't remember what's his name, he's a cobbler. Huh? That's Kabir. Kabir? Cobbler is a shoemaker, right? Yeah. Not another guy, no? Okay, oh, Kabir. Yeah. But he's the one that we knew, not that we, that's the only one we had. You know what I mean? Uh, you know why we know Kabir a lot? Hmm? Because he's, he's loud. <laughs> He wrote poetry, yeah? He fixed the fake, the uh, hypocrite, yeah? He fixed all the people who are not truly spiritual, yeah? Just for show, and wearing clothes, and uh, growing big, uh, make yourself look holy, but you're not. Yeah, that's why we know him, yeah? Because he has a very big mouth. <laughs> We love him for that also, yeah? The thing is, he was very brave, no? At that time, and he's only a shoemaker, and he dare speaks like that, no? So he must be a very brave person. Well, he has nothing to lose anyway, yeah? <laughs> he doesn't want, he doesn't care. He has uh, one beloved and very obedient wife. He also easy to sell it any time for a few pieces of chapatis <laughs> to to uh, treat his guests, yeah, who came to his house when he doesn't have enough money. Oh, you know what? Uh, Narusdin, Narusdin, yeah, Mullah Narusdin, he's also, uh, you know, not very rich, yeah? <laughs> and he makes fun of himself. Yeah, these are funny sayings, huh? Kabir and Narusdin, maybe they they are the reincarnation of each other, who knows? <laughs> or are they contemporary? I'm too lazy to check. Who's before and who's after? 
Kabir was before, right? Mm-hmm. Naruddin is a reason, more modern. He's such a funny guy. And he doesn't have money, but for what he wrote, you know, he was very enlightened, no? Yeah, okay. So just to prove to you that it doesn't matter if you have health, wealth, or position uh, or not, you still can be highly spiritually developed. Anyway, right? It's been proven. And uh, Hui Neng, you know, China, Liu Chu Hui Neng, huh? the, uh, the sixth patriarch, Zen patriarch of China, he also has nothing. He normally go and get wood, you know, and to take care, chop wood, eh? to sell, to take care of his mother. And uh, because he wanted to learn so much, somebody probably, uh, you know, an initiated eh? brother Chen, eh? help him, said say he will take care of his mother, don't worry, the Huynang's mother, and then give him money, everything, so that he can have the means to go to find the master. Because it's such a long way before, long way to go to China, you know, by horse or by donkey or by foot. Uh, he's from Vietnam anyway, yeah? But later the Chinese claim him to become like the Chinese. Oh, we don't care, Chinese, Vietnamese is all the same. What I mean is, he's also a very poor person. Yeah, he became enlightened, became the sixth patriarch of the Zen Buddhism at that time. And Bodhidharma, Bodhidharma was a prince. Yeah? And he forsake his princehood, he became a monk, yeah? I don't know what kind of monk he is, he wear the earring as big as my face. <laughs> <laughs> and he don't bother to shave too much, and his hair is long. Mm. Probably traveling, couldn't be bothered, you know? Okay. So what I mean is, enlightenment doesn't hang on wealth, position, or poverty. We have everything, right? As uh, Sekamuni Buddha, he, also, he was also a prince. Yeah? See what I mean? Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, Jesus Christ, he, he was a huh? carpenter. See what I mean? Yes. And all the uh, holy saints in Christian, the twelve apostles, the first twelve apostles, they're just fishermen. You see? There's no position, no profession, no wealth, uh, nothing can predict an enlightened person future. Eh? When is time? To come, when the time to come, he, he will just forsake everything and become initiated and become enlightened. Yeah. Okay. Now, after a time, a friend of his father heard of his new dwelling place and came to visit, drawn by esteem for his virtue. After expressing the usual friendly concern for his health, the visitor told the ascetic of his love for his father. And there naturally ensue a long conversation, during which the friend said with much affection the following, Isn't it possible that your reverence acted too impulsively in renouncing the world at such an early age, ignoring both the needs of your family and the importance of continuing your life, I mean, making babies. <laughs> Understand, yeah? yeah? What do you hope to gain here, in the forest? Maybe a hotel? <laughs> <laughs> You can lead a virtuous life in your home just as easily as in the wilderness. Why do you take on this difficult life? Striving to incarnate poverty itself. Here you must leave off the arms of strangers who think of you as nothing but a beggar. Cover with rags stripped of friends and relations, 
You hide here in the middle of the woods. Even your enemy's eyes would fill with tears to see you in this state. Such a beautiful state he means. Yeah, he means. He continued. Return to your home. You do not need this misery. There you will be able to fulfill both spiritual and familiar duties. There you can produce a fine son. See what I told you. <laughs> After all, if the poor can find the comfort of a castle in their meager huts, how much more comfort can be found in a wealthy residence, resplendent with luxuries? Mm. That was very nice, yeah? If he told him about a hotel in Russia, maybe he'd be tempted. <laughs> But the Bodhisattva's mind had been purified by the sweet and comforting ambrosia of detachment. In his heart, he knew too well the difference between the life of a householder and the life of an ascetic. It's true like that. I knew it too. I still long for the day when I was free. I am free now, but freer, you know? <laughs> I'm still nostalgic for those days when I don't have to worry about anything. Now, you know, worry about bill and tax, worry whether to pay on time, you know. You know. The government may run after you and then on the headline, you know, <laughs> worry the headline. <laughs> I hope the one who takes care here pay on time. Just tell Melly to pay it, okay? Yeah, understand? If not, then somebody please pay it, and then we will return quick when it's a uh, when it's time, and then uh, somebody forgot. Yeah, can you please help each other to remind? Okay, remind at what time to pay tax for me. Okay, understand, guy? Yeah, yeah. In his heart, eh, he knew too well the difference between the life of a householder and the life of an ascetic, and the encouragement to enjoy worldly pleasures only made him uneasy. As talk of a lavish meal affects those who are satiated. <laughs> you know, like somebody already too full and you keep talking about good meal and you, it means nothing to you anymore, right? Maybe even you didn't eat such a good meal when you just eat like a sandwich or anything, but you're full and you're full, yeah? Uh, you know, a uh, gourmet dinner don't taste anything to you and you're not really interested. Once you fall, you don't feel like wanting to eat anymore, right? Mm. Okay. So he told their visitor thus, What you have just said was spoken out of sincere affection and therefore does not truly distress me. He replied, Nevertheless, I beg you not to use the word comfort when speaking of one who lives in the world. The householder's state is like a prison, and whether one be rich or poor, such a life is full of pain. You see, the rich struggle to guard their wealth, and the poor struggle to gain it. <laughs> Both struggle, it is true. No comfort exists for either rich or poor, only ill and shoes. It is true that a householder can observe the precepts, but a task more difficult is hard to conceive. The householder's life is bound by concern far removed from the Dharma. It's true, it's true like that, it is true. I still don't know how I do it. <laughs> of course, I try to meditate as much as I can, eh? but I'm more free. <laughs> so anyway, mm. also it's good that I have a small house, because if I have a big house, well, I'd be too generous and let everybody come, and then I become a big householder <laughs> instead of just a few people or a husband and a few kids. Uh, many husbands, many kids. 
The householder's life is bound by concern far removed from the Dharma, I mean the true teaching, yeah? The true practice of spiritual attainment. They call it Dharma. Dharma is not only the teaching, it's a practice of the teaching, yeah, of the true teaching. Concerns which call for a great deal of attention. Consider this. How can the householder refrain from lying, from injuring others, from putting pressure on others? The householder is attached to happiness and cannot but strive to secure it. Yet, if you devote yourself to the Dharma, you must break away from the householder's concerns. So, if you are attached to the home life, how can you achieve the Dharma? It's true like that, you know? If you have a big household sometimes, and the people who you deal with people all day, especially people in your household, they keep telling you things, and then at night when you sit down to meditate, they all keep replaying, replaying again, again, and again. These nonsense garbage. That's why I don't like it when people talk too much about nonsense. Understand? I waste their time, I waste my time, and at night it bothers me. Yeah? He continued. Huh? The way of the Dharma has the taste of tranquility. The way of the householder tastes of busyness and distraction. The householder's life is in opposition to the Dharma. So who among those who truly care for themselves would stay in such a life? Yeah, it's truly like that. Even recently, I forgot about the Himalaya, but recently, you know, I mean, two, three years ago, when I stay alone in the cave, you know, ah, oh, that was really beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's the best time of my life. <laughs> the householder is easily tempted to neglect the Dharma. I told you. He seeks pleasure by all possible means and soon feels no restraint. Loss of reputation, remorse, and misfortune are sure to follow. Surely the wise are right to avoid a state which seeks pleasure to the detriment of the Dharma. Moreover, I do not see how a householder lives would bring joys, for the suffering caused by earning and guarding wealth never ends. The householder is always in danger of being killed, kidnapped, or being subjected to other such terrors. Even a king is no more satisfied by his riches than the ocean is filled by the rain. How can there be happiness in a state where one continually longs for sense objects rather than for self-perfection? One could sooner soothe a wound by rubbing it with salt. <laughs> Understand? Yeah. Like the householder life is like, is always suffering. And the more you try to seek happiness in it, the more you lose it. It's just like you already wounded and you rub it on with salt all the time. It's just getting more painful. That's what he means, yeah. Material prosperity makes the householder arrogant. Noble birth makes him proud. Yes, I know quite a few. That's why you can't get near them. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. They're too good to be near anyone. Uh, okay. So, left alone even to learn spiritual practice or sit at the feet of any master to ask, request for enlightening instruction. Yeah? That's very difficult. Material prosperity makes the household arrogant, yeah? 
Noble birth makes him proud. Strength makes him insolent. His anger is aroused by the smallest grief. His adversity brings deepest rejection. So when is there time for tranquility? Yeah, he's trying to prove it. And it's a true, no? True, huh? Therefore, sir, do not speak against my determination. The house is home to much misery. Haunted by the serpents of arrogance, pride, and infatuation. It destroys the possibility of happy tranquility. Who would choose to stay in a place so full of disturbances? In the forest, however, home of those who are content, the mind is calm and detached. Happiness such as this cannot be found even in Chakra's heaven. Chakra is one of the gut at that time, you know? Yeah, people one of those gods in heaven that people really aim to go to, the so-called one of the heavens, yeah. Though covered with rags and dependent on strangers, I delight to be here. How could I wish for happiness which is tainted by wrongdoing? It is like food tainted by poison. Here I have gained profound insight into the very heart of being. However, such persuasive words did not fail to impress his father's friend. Showing respect for the great being, he humbly offered him what he could, what he has carried with him. Yeah. From this story, one can see how those who truly wish to benefit themselves abandon the state of a householder, for they understand that such a state is in conflict with both the Dharma and tranquility. This account is also relevant when discussing the virtue of detachment. To show how those who have once tasted the joy of detachment, do not revert to worldly pleasures. Lucky guy, huh? Yeah, that's it. The story ends. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. Because he's a lucky guy. Yeah? Lucky guy. Uh, nobody go there and try to bother him. I did not want to leave the cave either, but something happened so that I had to leave. It's always the same. Whenever I hide, something happened <laughs> so that I had to go away, outside, into the world. Always the same stuff. So I have to do what I have to do. Okay, so lucky for you guys. <laughs> All right. I see you later. Okay. Maybe meditate for a while, and then I will leave. I mean, I will not leave. I will stay downstairs. Okay. Turn off the light. We meditate. You pay compliment to somebody without meaning it. That's also a lie. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Anyway. Okay. You know what? <laughs> you know what? If Actually, truly is like that. If we continue the household life, we always have to uh, I would say adjust to that kind of life all the time, yeah? Have to be, you know, like, I don't know, polite to the neighbors, worry what the neighbor thinks, take care of many things. And, you know, if you have a husband, then you have the in-laws, and then the relatives, and the husband's friends. And if you have a good husband who has a good friends, then it's okay. But if the husband or the boyfriend have bad friends, influence him badly, you also suffer. Eh? Your relationships suffer. Because now and again they say something. Oh, 
I saw somebody look like her yesterday holding somebody's hand. It looked like her only. I don't think it's her. But I already make a question in the husband's head, no? or the boyfriend, for example, like that. Mm. And uh, well, it's just a lot of trouble. And the in-laws, you always have to be nice to them or else. No? Even then, sometimes you be nice and still misunderstanding. Still a lot of trouble. No? <laughs> Remember the joke with... <laughs> That the woman went to the police and said, husband missing, please find him. <laughs> and then uh, the police, okay, what's the first thing you want us to tell him if we found him? She said, Don't worry, mother didn't come after all. <laughs> so scared. Yeah, sometimes it's like that. And there was a, also a joke about the police call a husband says, hey, uh, we, we found your wife here. And then so the husband said, what do I have to do? He said, you come here, you sign the paper, and you pay $500, and that's that. The husband, husband said, oh, how much if you keep her? different face today. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, let's tell some joke and laugh a little bit, huh? <laughs> huh? Today is all uh, Asian? You look like Asian to me. <laughs> Japanese? <laughs> One day, the neighbor said to the Hoja, I don't know what Hoja, probably a teacher no? in Turkey. This is from Turkey. <laughs> Must be from Nasruddin again. <laughs> Have you a wine that is 40 years old? The visitor asked. Yes, I have. Uh, replied the Hoja, probably the innkeeper. Huh? What does it mean, Hoja? Anybody know? Hoja? What mean? Teacher. Teacher, oh, so I was right in the beginning. Aha, uh -huh. wonderful. I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the Turkish? Yeah. Wow, how come you don't make any program on Turkish, Turkey for me? Yeah, I want to. I'm preparing. Uh, uh, preparing. <laughs> Thinking about it, right? Okay, do it. I want people to know your country. Otherwise, they only know, you know, guest workers in Germany, you know. They are not treated well everywhere. Not everywhere, okay? You have to make a lot of Turkish program for me, okay? To let people know the greatness of your country, all right? Yes. Okay, we uh, begin again. One day, a neighbor said, a neighbor, huh, said to the Hoja, have you a wine that is 40 years old? Yes, I have. Um, the neighbor asked, Can you give me a little? He said, No. <laughs> the heart just said, No. I said, Why so? You're supposed to be generous and kind, no? He said, If I give everybody a little here, a little there, then it won't last. <laughs> it won't be 40 years old anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it's true like that, huh? Okay. Someone asked, Hoja, uh, why do people go to different directions when they leave their houses in the morning? <laughs> what a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds, sounds familiar to me. Huh? <laughs> Some <laughs> intelligent question, huh? Yeah, yeah. The Hodja answered without hesitation. If all of them would go to the same direction, this would throw off the balance of the world. 
<laughs> yeah. I'll go on one side, no? Actually, I heard at one time, you know, it's on some of the gossipy newspaper, the uh, credibility is not guaranteed. It says something like, on such and such day, the Chinese people, or oh, I mean, how many billion are they? Two? 1.3. Huh? 1.3. 1.3, okay. All 1.3 of them made a point to jump up and down, jump up and down, <laughs> all together at one time. <laughs> I don't know, just to <laughs> probably to balance the world. <laughs> or to send uh, the Americans shivering, <laughs> create a quake, a man-made quake, a made-in-China quake. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Okay. One day, when Timur was going hunting, ah, my dear, well, Timur probably is a king, yeah. He wanted Hodja to join him in front of the palace. During hunting, suddenly it began to rain. I don't believe what kind of Hodja who go hunting. Maybe he go along just to to try to change the king. Or Timur is king, right? Yeah. Oh, I know everything. <laughs> Why do I need to ask you? <laughs> I must have been like a, a Turkish in the last life, who knows? Maybe I was a Timur. Uh, Timur. Okay, so during the hunting, suddenly it began to rain. Everybody put their horses to the gallop and run away. Ah, but the Hodja couldn't. As the weather was hot, he took off his clothes and put them under him. And so he returned slowly to the palace. When the rain was over, he put on his clothes again. When he arrived at the palace, his clothes were dry, and the Timur was most astonished. We all got wet. How is it that you are still dry? So the Hodja replied, Oh, sir, with the help of this horse, I arrived at the palace without getting wet. <laughs> wow, incredible horse, huh? So, ah, another hunting trip. Timur wanted the horse, which was given to the Hodja. Before, you know, in the last trip. Ah, by a great coincidence, it, it again began to rain, and the Timur got wet. <laughs> What do we expect? <laughs> Such an unintelligent king. But it was the Hodja's fault, no? He should not tell lie, no? <laughs> probably, probably he did put this under the horse. Yeah, huh? But they say put it under him. If uh, they put it under the horse, then, uh, you know what I mean? Like you tied it under his stomach. And maybe it's even better. Probably that's what he did. So he also didn't tell real lie, he just didn't tell detail. <laughs> okay, we let him off the hook. <laughs> ah. When he came back to the palace, he angrily uh, called the Hodja and asked what it meant. Oh, sir, the Hodja said, I'm very, very sorry. I forgot to tell you that you also had to put your clothes under you, and then you would not get wet. <laughs> yeah, he meant that uh, the horse took him to the palace, of course, no, I didn't tell the detail. Uh, all right. There's another story now. 
Cut Black Book. Once upon a time, the Hoja was a judge, and one day a man came to him. Your cow has killed mine, he cried out. The Hoja shouted, You silly fella, how can the cow know what it is a crime to kill any other cow? Case dismissed. <laughs> the man said, Oh, sorry. I said it wrong. My cow has killed yours. Then this is another problem, said the Hodja. We will open the black book and see what it says. Black book is a book of judgment, the law. No? Okay. When he's killed somebody else's, then it's different. When somebody else's killed his, then that's another case. Moo. <laughs> another one. At midnight, the Harja heard a loud noise. Two men were struggling outside. The Harja got out of his bed with a blanket over him and went to the front of his house. He asked them what they were fighting, why they were fighting. Hmm. Maybe I need something like this, huh? You know, a stand or something? In China, all the monks have them so they can put the Bible on top and read. Can just make one with the clear plastic, you know, and then stand it here and then easy. Especially when I'm a little tired. I'm not physically invincible, huh? I hope you know that. Well, it doesn't look like any of you know, but the master does everything. <laughs> master is invincible. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I mean, physically, yes. <laughs> okay, so the guy, Hotja, went out with a blanket and asked the two guys what, why they were fighting. Without answering, one of them took the blanket that covered with the Hotja. They covered the Hotja, and they both fled. So the poor Hotja returned to his bed again without blanket. What were they fighting about? asked his wife. <laughs> about our blanket, <laughs> said the Hodja. Now the blanket is gone, so the struggle is over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is, um, you know, Mula Narusdin again, you know, it's the same. It's just in Turkish, they write it Nasretin Hodja instead of uh, Mu Mula Narusdin, yeah. Every country claim him, <laughs> you know. I'm not surprised if the Vietnamese say, Narusdin is ours, <laughs> it's Vietnamese. <laughs> yeah, because uh, <laughs> he's Muslim, you know, he's Muslim and he's a very funny guy. Not only he make fun of someone else, he make fun of himself too, you know. So he's very famous actually. Vietnamese also translated his story, his joke, into our language, you know, Olaxi's language. And the Chinese also translated into Chinese language. And the Vietnamese translated from the Chinese language. <laughs> Probably uh, the Chinese translated from English, and the English translated from Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, here yeah, it is, yeah. And the Turk is translated from Persia. And who know where from, huh? This guy is really international. <laughs> this is called busybody. One day people said to the Hodja, Hey, your wife walks from house to house. Tell her she mustn't walk so much. All right, said the Hodja. If she comes to our house, I will tell her. 
<laughs> will she ever come to the house? At the end, maybe. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> yeah. What is his business anyway, huh? To mind his wife's job. Okay. This one called Cut and Deliver. After the hot jar got the recipe for liver from his friend, I'm sorry, this, uh, I don't know, this uh, Muslim, you know? They eat uh, meat, huh? Some, yeah? Some, not all, but some. Probably at that time he did. I'm not sure if it's like that, or maybe vegetarian liver, I don't know. Hmm? At that time, to be vegetarian is something out of ordinary, you know? Even nowadays, many people are a closet vegetarian, yeah? They don't even dare to tell people that they are vegetarian. Poor guys. For worrying that he might stand out like a sore thumb. thumb. Or worrying that people might, might laugh at him or alienate it from him, yeah? Mm. So uh, before, you know, also maybe within our group, you know, I don't bother to tell you vegetarian chicken, huh? Uh, I, or maybe vegetarian liver, you know, maybe I just say uh, liver, not <laughs> chicken. But you know very well, they're not chicken, they're not liver, and they're not fish, they're nothing. And they make sometimes, they make it look like egg, yeah? I say, oh, put some egg, fry some eggs for us, yeah? Because we know already, that means are vegan. Yeah, vegan anyway. Most of vegetarian food are vegan, except the one that with milk, yeah? And we avoid that, yeah, if we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, nowadays it's good that uh, we have um, international market, eh? You can even order by email, by phone, and you can just stay anywhere in uh, Alaska corner, <laughs> and you call London, UK center, <laughs> send me some cheese, <laughs> yeah, vegan cheese. Eh? But nowadays they make all kinds, eh? They look the same, eh? Uh, tastes really good though, huh? Yeah. Okay, so probably this is a, a record from his own disciples or by some nearby acquaintance, yeah, by the way, yeah? So it become natural that it's just liver. Actually, many Muslims are vegetarian, especially the Sufis order, yeah? Mm. Now, okay. Okay, now after he got the recipe for liver from his friend, he bought again some liver and because he liked it very much, he wanted to eat it more often. But every time when he brought livers, that he couldn't eat it. Every time he brought it home, he couldn't eat it, because his wife said that the cat took the liver and fled away. Meow! <laughs> Bye! <laughs> so one day, the Hodja became very angry and said, Woman, I brought liver, where is it? So his wife said, Oh, the silly cat took it and fled away. <laughs> Same again and again. Must be his wife. <laughs> Not possible that she keep letting him eat in it, right? Because it's easy to, to cover, you know? Because for the dog, and you have to hang up or close it in a big closet, and then lock it. <laughs> but for the cat, all you do is just cover it with some heavy stuff, and then he will never... Or put it in a pan and cover it, a part of a pan, then he will never take it. <laughs> His wife <laughs> you know, sees something, huh? <laughs> At the same time, the cat was in the room. The hot jar caught it brought a steely, steel yard and weighted the cat. The scale, you know? He put the cat on the scale and weighed it. 
Then he said, that is exactly two kilos. And the liver which I bought, which I bought was also two kilos. Now tell me, if that is the liver, where is my cat? <laughs> if that is the cat, then I want my liver. <laughs> See what I mean? I knew it was his wife. <laughs> Some wife, huh? Don't even let him have half of it. <laughs> 